exactly. But what the Samaritan Pentateuch is, and I don't know. I mean, I have no idea this date. That's a guess on this one. But the Samaritan Pentateuch is, remember what happened in Israel. Where is the capital of Israel? Tel Aviv. No. Well, I mean, the, the real capital. Jerusalem. Okay, Jerusalem. Okay. Where is the other place? When Israel got divided, where is the other capital throughout the book of Kings and Chronicles? Samaria. Samaria. Samaritan Pentateuch. They changed certain things in the Bible from Jerusalem to Samaria. It is a very, very reliable text, just like the Bible, but they have changed certain things to say that these sacrifices belong up here. Okay, So maybe it predates Christ. I don't know how old it is, but what I'm saying is the Samaritan Pentateuch is called, Pentateuch means five books. Penta, five, and then Tuch would be Tuchus. I don't know. Anyway, so you have the Samaritan Pentateuch. Okay? It's the five books. This is called the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, or the Torah, the instruction. Okay, All they did was change the focus of the Samaritan Pentateuch to Samaria. But everything else is very, very reliable. And so we can say, this says this, and this says this. And then we have other witnesses. Probably, my guess is, and I, I don't know, it may say DSS also, it may not, but the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, have confirmed many times things in the Old Testament. And that's one of them we're going to get right now. Go to Psalm 22, and I know we've done this before, but let's do it anyway so you can see the agenda of the Masoretes. Okay, Psalm 22, and when you get to Psalm 22, read uh, verse 16. God has surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Okay, read the footnote from the NIV on verse 16. NIV, and maybe somebody else. I have it here in the New King James Version. Do you want NIV? Whatever. If you have a footnote for verse 16, read it. Some Hebrew manuscripts. So the Septuagint. And the Syriac. Syriac. Okay, wait a minute. Hebrew manuscripts, the Septuagint, and oops, the Syriac. and the Syriac version, S Y R, okay? Most Hebrew manuscripts slash like the lion. Okay, so here we go. The Masoretic text in other Hebrew manuscripts says like a lion. Okay? So here's what it would read. Here is how it would read in the 22nd Psalm in the Masoretic text. Here's what it's going to say. It's going to say, For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me like a lion, my hands and my feet. Does that make any sense at all? No. Of course not. What they've done is they've taken the same, very close, it's called emending, E-M-E-N-D-I-N-G. Emendation is to take a different meaning of a particular verse, change it just enough so that it reads differently. Okay? They have emended this text to, instead of saying... Can't deny that it would be Christ. That's right. They are saying, like a lion, my hands and my feet, in these major Hebrew manuscripts. But guess what? Some of the lesser Hebrew manuscripts read it correctly. How do we know? Because it's also read in the Alex X, which predates Christ. It's written in the Syriac version. Okay, another, I think it's an Aramaic copy of the Old Testament. All right, let's do one more so you can see the... Mine says Vulgate. Vulgate. Okay, here's another one. The Latin Vulgate as well. That so, says like a line too. Oh, it does. Okay, well that's a problem, okay, because the Vulgate is translated from very old texts. So there was already, at the time of the Vulgate, which is not long, what, 300 AD, there were already people changing that particular verse. So which one is right? Let's go to another one so we can see absolutely, yes? It says, possible form of the verb K-U-R, bore, Kur, right. By Revolutionizing, altering the vowel signs, which are not written as letters in HP. The letters K, possibly R-I, could be made to mean as a line. That's right. So you see what they're saying in Hebrew. These are letters. You've got Aleph, and you've got Bet, and you've got Gimel. All right. Whoops, I'm sorry. Terrible Gimel. All right. Anyway, you've got a Gimel, and you've got a Dalit. Okay. All of these are consonants. Hebrew has 22 consonants and no vowels. So if you want to change Aleph A to, uh, which is part of, uh, it's not a vowel by the way, but anyway, if you, want to, if you want to read differently, you're going to put a dot here, it's going to be E. If you put a dot up here, it's going to be O. If you put a T under it, it's going to say ah. Okay, same thing with this one, bait. You have bait. Put a dot under it, it says B. Put a dot above it, bo. 
right? You put a T under it, ba, okay? Or if you put two dots under it, be, okay? What he's saying is this word, if you amend it, it's going to change from pierce my hands and my feet to like a lion, okay? Your choice, obviously, okay? But here's a more obvious one. We're going to go to the Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Yeah, Diane remembers this one. Okay. And th there are several of these in the Bible, okay? I mean, it's not like uh, Isaiah 53. You're going to find this a few times. And why would it be this way? You have to ask yourself, why are these differences? Because somebody has an agenda. Okay, Isaiah 53, and then we're going to go to... Um, uh, probably, where is it? Verse 11. Go ahead and read verse 11 from, let me read it from the King James Version, okay? I'm going to read uh, verse 53, Isaiah 53 from the King James Version. Verse 11, it says, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge uh, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Does anybody have anything else in there, like in the NIV? After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life. Ah, there is something in there, right? Okay, now read the footnote. Wait a minute. Go ahead. Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, Dead Sea Scrolls. See also Septuagint, LXX, okay? Math Okay, so here we go. Masoretic text, no light of life. But the Dead Sea Scrolls, guess what they found? In, okay, once again, the Masoretic text dates to when? 1030 AD, right? About that, that's about the oldest copy, somewhere in that area. Okay, Dead Sea Scrolls goes back to when? Well, they found them when? They found them in 1947, one year before the reestablishment of Israel. Okay, and they predate Christ by about 200 years, I believe. 200 A.D., 250 A.D. Same with the LXX. Both of these say, and his soul shall see the light of life. And all of a sudden, it's missing out of here. Yeah. It's obviously speaking of the resurrection. It's obviously. And it's not in this one, but it's in these ones. See that? Okay, so you're going to see this. And that's why I say, when you read your Bible... I recommend you read the footnotes, always. If you want to read the commentary, take the commentary with a grain of salt. That doesn't mean don't read it, but read it and take it. Just like when I teach you, take it with a grain of salt. But the footnotes will tell you what's going on in here. And it's, this, to me, is the most interesting aspect of Bible study, is this. Because you are really finding out what is in there. What's that? But wouldn't you say that one translation would stay consistent? And no, and here's why. Well, what I'm, what I'm saying is, why are they showing the Masoretic text up here? Right. Instead of, but back here they were showing the Septuagint. Septuagint. They it, should stay consistent. Well, that's what the King James Version did, except in this case. And the, the reason why is because if something is obvious, you need to do the obvious. And that, this is called textual criticism. They go in and they say, we have the Septuagint. We've got the Vulgate, we've got the Syriac, we've got the Samaritan Pentateuch, we've got the Masoretic Text. Now we are basing our translation, we'll say the King James Version, we are basing it on the Masoretic Text. From Genesis all the way to Malachi, we're using the Masoretic Text. But we have six versions. Five of them say that this is correct and one of them says this isn't. Those five are older than this one and they're more than likely authentic. But I'm wondering why we would use Masoretic Text of all. Well, because that was the standard for years. We did, well, we didn't have the DSS. We didn't have the LXX, or maybe they had parts of it, okay? They didn't have the Samaritan Pentateuch or the Syriac. So if they want to go back and redo everything, they'd rather just put a footnote. Or use it in the top and footnote it down here. But you've got to understand that footnoting things is being honest about things. Do you see what I'm saying? Whereas commentaries do their own thing. Leaving something out, and you know one thing they do in the NIV, what they do in some of these Bibles is when they footnote it, they sometimes don't include it in the top. And they will say, but 
for your information, this reads this way and this and this and this. To me, that is the most honest way of handling something. Let the people decide. We chose this and here's why. Normally, their choices are explained right here. That's why I, this is the first thing I do when I get a new Bible is I read this. And they tell you all, not really the preface, but the, uh, uh, sometimes it's in the preface and sometimes it's in something called the, uh, but the preface has all of this in here. Some of them have a preface. This is, you know, why we're doing a version of the Bible. And then they have the notes, which is, this is combined preface and notes. But they tell you exactly what they use and why. And if they defer, defer from that text, then they will tell you why they are doing it. And to me, this is as important as anything in the Bible, not as important as the Bible, but what I'm saying is it's as important why they have chosen this. Because these people have put, as far as I'm concerned, their lives on the line. They are handling God's word, and they are actually translating it. And the more footnotes you put in there, the safer you are, I believe, with the Lord. Because you are saying, this dates to this time, and this says this, and this dates to this time, and it says this. And we have these differences. Here's why we chose it. To me, that's just being as honest as possible. Now, if you go to you know, the New World Translation of the, uh, the Bible, the Jehovah's Witnesses, well, they say that we're using the, uh, the originals in the New Testament where it says Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah. Well, guess what they've done? Okay, if you go, they will say, they'll use, um, uh, they call them J-texts. Jehovah text, J1, J13, whatever, okay? Like, you know, we have what we call the SP or the LXX or the whatever. They call them the J text in there, all right? One of them, I don't know which one, there's like 14 of them, but one of these J texts was written by a guy named Hashem, okay? Which means the great name. But Hashem wrote his text, believe it or not, as a polemic against Christianity. He was a Jew. And so he took the Christian scriptures and he wrote them in Hebrew as a polemic against, in other words, a, uh, 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 an argument against Christianity. And he said, Jehovah says, Jehovah says, when it's clear that the word is Kyrios, Lord, okay? And he said, Jehovah here. And they use this as an inspired text when it was written against Christianity. Okay, wait. Okay. Oh, one more. Then another thing they do, we'll say it's J6. I don't know which one. And it says, if you go to J6, they say this is J6, and you go to, they, they have the original of J6, and it was done by, um, we'll say, uh, I, I don't know their names, I'm just making this up. But J6 is, uh, was translated by Wilkinson and Blyer in the ma service of Her Majesty the Queen of England. Okay, right? On the top of J6, it says, translated, translated out of the original tongues, okay? Tongue or whatever, okay? It says it right here on that. Now, what is the original tongue of the New Testament? No, no, New Testament. New Greek. Greek. So, J is in Hebrew. They acknowledge that this is written out of the Greek. So, the original is not this. The original is the Greek. They are using this as an original, and all these people are doing is translating it into that, and they're inserting the name of Jehovah, okay? When, in fact, it doesn't ever, ever, ever say Jehovah in the Greek, right? But they are saying that this is the original, and they're misleading their people, the Jehovah's Witnesses, by saying, this is the original, and it claims it's Jehovah. When these people just simply translated it for Her Majesty the Queen into Hebrew, for whatever reason she wanted a Hebrew copy of the New Testament, and they translated certain portions of it, Jehovah, the Lord, because it's apparent. It's a translation from the Old Testament. Thus says Jehovah, right? And Paul says that. Thus says the Lord. But the same word, Lord, is kurios in Greek. It doesn't matter what you say. Kurios, okay? But they are saying Jehovah is the original. When it was translated out of Greek, so this can't be the original. And yet they put Jehovah in there and they deceive the people that don't know this. And this is what I did that day with those guys. I sat there for four hours talking to him, explaining this, and it was like, this was what it was like. It, 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 they had no idea. Even if they had an idea, they were not willing to take off the glasses and say, oh boy, you know what? Unbelievable.